Deadlines are looming for witnesses surrounding the investigation into the January 6th attack on the U.S. Capitol. Today, documents are due from the organizers of the January 6th rally, while former Pentagon Chief of Staff Kash Patel and one-time Trump strategist and White House Counselor Steve Bannon are both scheduled to appear for depositions tomorrow. Mark Meadows, the former chief of staff, Dan Scavino, uh, the king of social media for the White House, the Trump White House, they are slated to appear Friday. Congresswoman Liz Cheney and the vice chair of the January 6th Select Committee said last night, we'll see if they show up. If they show up, we'll be prepared. Joining me now is Democratic Congressman Adam Schiff, the intelligence chair on the House side who was on the January 6th Select Committee. He was, of course, lead manager during President Trump's first impeachment trial and is the chair of the House Intelligence Committee, as we say. And his new book is Midnight in Washington, uh, How We Almost Lost Our Democracy and Still Could. And it really is a clarion call for action and a warning. So congratulations on the book. It's quite Thank an you. achievement. Thank you. And it's an inside story, the first we've ever had from the lead player on the prosecution side of the first Trump impeachment. Uh, talk to me first about this deadline criminal uh, contempt citations against those who don't comply? Yes, uh, we are deadly serious about getting to the bottom of everything that happened uh, up to January 6th and thereafter. And if witnesses don't appear when they're supposed to, if they don't produce the documents, we intend to move very quickly to uh, have a vote in the House uh, to hold them in criminal contempt, refer to the Justice Department for prosecution. Isn't that a very time-consuming process? We saw what happened with the original Trump witnesses and how you never got to even talk to some of them until it was long, long after the process. Um, the process of civil litigation is very lengthy. For Don McGahn, the former White House counsel, it took two years before we could get his deposition. But we didn't have the opportunity to do what we will do uh, now, which is hold people in criminal contempt, refer them for prosecution. When Bill Barr was attorney general, there was no way he was going to prosecute someone who was covering up for Donald Trump. He viewed the Justice Department as essentially Trump's criminal defense firm. It's different now, uh, different attorney general, one that believes in the rule of law. So we intend to enforce these subpoenas. What is the process once they get enforced by the Justice Department? They can still go to court. Can't they tie you up in knots going well, through the system? It would be in the context of a criminal prosecution. And I think if someone uh, thumbs their nose at the law, doesn't comply, is prosecuted, it will be a powerful message to others that they darn well better comply. Uh, so it's a whole different ballgame, I think, when you're talking about a criminal proceeding than lengthy civil litigation. What does it mean when we are told that several of these players are engaged with the committee? Does that just mean communicating, or does that mean that they're actually potentially cooperating, or do you expect that they're all going to fight it? Uh, it means they're, they're communicating through counsel. Um, whether that will ultimately mean communication or obstruction, uh, I, I can't say. But, uh, but that's all uh, that that means. Um, part of the problem, and I, and I write about this in the book, is for four years, people like Steve Bannon believed that they could thumb their nose at the Congress, they could ignore subpoenas, even Republican subpoenas, and they would be protected by a Department of Justice leadership that would never go after them. Um, but if Steve Bannon thinks that's the case now, he's going to find out otherwise. When you talk about Steve Bannon, executive privilege, you know, I guess it's a legally debatable uh, notion that a former president can try to assert executive privilege upon White House communications. But Steve Bannon was out of the White House long before any of this happened. He was at the Willard Hotel or at other places organizing or communicating with the former president before that rally. So how does that stand up in court? It, it doesn't stand up, uh, which is why uh, I think he's on very perilous, perilous grounds if he simply refuses because the former president is telling him to refuse. Um, so it won't hold up. Talk to me about January 6th. You were there. You write about putting on your gas mask and you know, how it felt to be on that House floor. Uh, it was just awful um, to be there, to hear the windows breaking, uh, to um, see the kind of beatings uh, that police took. And, uh, and, and what was particularly, uh, I think, heinous for many of us is to see that even after this had happened, while there was blood still on the floor, we returned to this chamber um, and the Republicans just picked up where they left off, still pushing the big lies, still trying to overturn the election. 
Uh, when I saw the footage of the people scaling the Capitol, because while we were in that chamber, of course, we didn't have visibility on, on what was happening outside. Um, you know, I looked at those people and, and they believe the big lie. But one of the things I write about in the book is um, so many of my Republican colleagues understand it is a big lie. They're just too f uh, scared uh, to say it. Um, and by challenging the legitimacy, legitimacy of our elections, they are pulling out one of the pillars of our democracy. Uh, because if we can't count on elections to decide who shall govern, that, that just leads to violence. And, and so uh, one of the things I wanted to convey in the book, there have been a lot of books about inside the White House. There's really been nothing yet about inside the Congress. How was Donald Trump able to completely remake a political party practically overnight? Um, how did so many of my colleagues come to capitulate to his immorality? Uh, I wanted to tell that personal story, um, but also the heroes that you know, people like Marie Ivanovich and Bill Taylor and others that really showed us the path forward. When you talk about your colleagues and what's happening in legislatures and state houses around the country. Is that the continuing threat you're worried about, that elections will no longer be definitive, that the very sense of if you win, you win, is no longer going to be the case? That, that's exactly what I'm worried about. Um, you know, as a member of the select committee, we have to acknowledge there could be another violent attack on the Capitol. Uh, the president is still pushing the big lie that motivated the first attack on the Capitol. But the more uh, dire threat, I believe, is what's going on around the country in state legislatures where Republicans are taking away the authority of independent elections officials and giving them to people beholden to Donald Trump. Um, they're trying to succeed where they failed before. Uh, I call them insurrectionists in suits and ties. And that's how democracies come to an end. It's not always by violence. It's often by the cloak of legality, the, the appearance of legality. Um, but really using democracy to attack itself. The personal threats, the death threats, the way your family was affected, um, what does it say about public service? We've seen this happen to Dr. Fauci and to others in high profile in this polarized society. What are we going through? Uh, what are you going through? Well, um, it, this was a hard part to write about in the book uh, because I remember standing in the kitchen with my wife and uh, tears in her eyes about the threats we were getting and, and just the fact that so many millions of people hated her husband. Um, and, you know, it was one of those things where it, it just picked up over time and I wasn't even aware of it happening, but uh, it does come, come crashing in on you. And my circumstance is not uh, sadly atypical. There are a lot of death threats to a lot of members now. Um, people sending bullets to our offices, calling. Uh, I had one person call and say, this is the gun I'm going to use. I'm going to put three bullets in the back of his head. Um, and you find yourself um, uncomfortable sitting next to an open window in your home. And that's not something I ever thought I would have to think uh, in this country.